Ken's Open Forum. This year's theme is reducing inequality by enabling inclusive and resilient internet through global partnerships for sustainable development. And you've got a unique opportunity here. ICANN is a long-standing supporter of the IGF. We have four members of our board here. So you have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce them. They all have long experience in the space. Edmund Chung is uh, working on internationalized domain names and universal acceptance, making the internet accessible in multiple languages and scripts. Martin Butterman, who is the former, mem the former chair of the board, and has a long-term support of the Dynamic Coalition on the Internet of Things. Joran Marby, who is the CEO of ICANN, and Avri Doria, who is a long-term supporter of the importance of Internet governance schools. We will have an opportunity for you to all ask questions and we will take them after the speakers have handled some initial comments. Before we go to the panel, what I'd like to do is ask my colleague Vera Major, who's our online moderator, and she's going to go over the session guidelines and how to ask your questions. Thank you. I've been just given a mic. For unsigned participant, if you wish to speak and ask a question during the session, raise your hand and we will pass a mic to you. For virtual participants, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, please note that I will read aloud comments and questions submitted in English within the designated discussion time. Uh, when submitting a question, or a comment that you want to read out loud on the mic, please start with question and end with question, or comment and end with comment. Text outside these quotes will be considered part of the chat and, not, and will not be read out loud on the microphone. I will also be posting uh, these in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Let us get started then. So how does ICANN support global meaningful connectivity and sustainable development? Avri, can we start with you? Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, my apologies. Yaron is going to give some introductory remarks. That gives me more time to think. I don't have to. I would be very happy if I don't have to talk again. Anyway, my friends, thank you very much, and thank you, Mary, for getting your CEO. <clears throat> um, so, yes, I just want to set the sort of the, 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 the not the standard, but just to uh, to wrap this discussion in, because I know there's a lot of discussions here at IGF about many different things. So, what we see here, what you see here, is actually what we're representing that what we call the part of the technical community. The tech, we, we often talk about that, and we try to explain this, that in the simple terms, most of you know this, that the DNA of, of the internet consists of three different parts, the IP addresses, the IP, IP protocols, and the DNS. When you use all of those three things, you actually do have an internet. And it's the most successful technology in world history. Today we have more than five billion users who's actually using all those three identifiers. Every system you go on, every device you use on, any network you use on, if a spectrum, you always use those three, and you're on the internet. So the way we have done this, and the interesting thing with all of this is that this was brought up not by committees, not by companies, not by governments or anything else. It was actually private individuals who actually started um, to, to explore and do things to create this internet. That became what we now talk and call about a multi-stakeholder model. So you should, when you think about the multi-stakeholder model, which everybody talks about here, we can actually prove to you it actually has been successful because we have provided together, and it's not only ICANN, we also have a representative ITF here. We also have a representative ITF here who doesn't listen, so. <laughs> um, so, but, but the fact of the matter is that what we've done over those decades 
is to use the technology that, everybody, that works all the time. But one of the things is also, we're not done. And that's why, one of the reasons why having those sessions is to invite you also to something that is still its involvement. And we can talk about, often in this conference here, or in the, during the ITF, it's about all the problems. I actually want to talk about some of the successes that we've done together. Because ICANN and ITF and the RERs and all the acronyms we do, no one thing, or the country code operators are part of this as well. Um, we have done this, um, we have done this with the help of corporations or people all over the world in different organizations, but still we know we have more things to do. One of the things we focus on right now, here especially, and Edwin is going to talk more about that, is that when internet came around, when it, was, when it was actually started, what happened was, of course, because it was started in the US, English language was the language that was used. And so 80% of all, uh, all domain names today are in English, 20% of the people in the world actually speaks English. And to be able to get the next billion users online, you shouldn't need to only have to read English from left to right with a dot. You should be able to use your own language. We call it scripts as well, that the computer should recognize the script you're using. Because the next billion users will not have the ability to be that well trained, and by the way, they wouldn't. And, and, and this is a very hard technology thing to talk about to get people to the access to the internet. But I also see another risk in this one. And that risk is that if we don't fix this problem, three generations down, maybe the only thing all our grandchildren are talking about, if I ever get any, is this going to be like simplified English or an internet English. And languages is a part of our history. Language is a part of our way to express ourselves. It's an important thing to keep. Differences are good, not bad. So a part of the discussion we're going to have today is the importance, and we use words like IDNs and universal acceptance, but actually this is much more fun than the acronyms we're using. This is really on making sure that the next billion users and beyond can utilize the internet on their behalf the way we want to do it. Thank you very much. And now over to answer the question to Avery. You remember the question? Yeah, I do. It had to do with what do we do? Oh yeah, I'll try to keep the microphone in front of my mouth. Uh, what do we do to try and foster meaning, global, meaningful connectivity and sustainable development? A real mouthful, sort of one of those uh, word salads that, that I sort of take and sort of try to parse the various words. Now certainly the global part is something that, that is a very much included in you know, trying to reach every part of Earth, all populations, with domain names, with IP addresses, with systems that support them, by working with the IRRs, by RIRs, by using the technology that the IETF gives us, and, and, and such. So the global part is really one of almost the easier ones to define. There's no part of this world that we don't want to touch, that we don't want to try and provide a, a level of the connectivity. Now, the connectivity depends on more than just what ICANN does, but the connectivity does require the addressing, and it does require the naming to allow people to use it. Now, this goes somewhat to what you know, uh, Joran was saying in terms of the, the domain names, the names in people's scripts and, and languages, something that you know, Ed Edmund and, and some previous board members I see in our audience could talk about far better than I ever could. Thank you, Akinori. Um, and and, and uh, so, you know, that, that's an important part of the connectivity. Now, the connectivity also goes to, there's a very large technical section within ICANN that basically works with, with the servers, the, the, the root servers that sort of uh, make it, you know, ICANN has its own root server and the IMRS is what we call it, um, the ICANN management, Managed Root Server, which is a new name that I'm still learning. It used to have another one letter name. Um, and, and managing that, the, the announcement that, that, that's been coming out and been talked about and there are cards about, about putting instances of that in Africa and such something that others could talk about in detail. It's funny, in most of these things, there's somebody else that can talk about it in more detail than I can. Um, then, you know, in, in connectivity, we also look at 
the names, you know, how do we distribute names? How do we get more domain names out into the wild, into the market, into people's hands? Domain names that, again, are in people's scripts, are in people's alphabets, um, you know, are, uh, and, and, and languages and such. So, so those are, you know, various pieces of it that all contribute to that, that connectivity part. Certainly someone else is doing the wires, someone else is doing the Wi-Fi, someone else is doing the 5G, but in terms of what makes it meaningful, what makes it able to be used, we do a lot in terms of providing policies, organizing that, monitoring that, etc. cetera. Um, now, the meaningful is actually a very interesting word because W what is meaningful to the many people of the world? And it's certainly something that me sitting here cannot say. See, once again, I'm finding other people to point to for what something means. Is meaningful is one of the reasons we support such a large policy community, that we have in a large community that, that, that reaches out to as many places on the globe as we can get, to have people that contribute to the policy making, giving advice, and sort of, of what is meaningful for them. When we're talking about a new set of policies for a new set of names, what's meaningful to people from various countries? It's something that to be meaningful, we really have to rely on the, the, the bringing in of more people, that outreach that, that basically works on giving advice to that. And then the sustainability and the sustainable development. Um, again, others could talk about this in much more detail, but there are various programs within ICANN, not only the, the African cluster now, but, but various supports, supports for applicants when there are domain names to be applied for, and various other kinds of support, support for the people that come and do policy. And, and sort of, so making sure that we've made sure that we've provided a sense of not only doing it once, not only getting advice once, but making sure that there's the possibility of continuity and, and being able to, to sort of continue to develop policies, continue to put, develop operations and mechanisms that can persist and be sustainable. I think I'll stop there, having hit all the words. Would anyone else on the panel like to add to that answer? Martin? Sure, I, I, I think a lot has been said. And one thought that I want to give to you to consider this further as well. Also, when the internet started, it was made to help, to, 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 to connect. It wasn't made to be safe. So that's one of the things that now what we do on the internet today, it also needs to be safe and safer every day. And that will be one of the journeys. The second trajectory relates very much to what was said about the new communities. When the internet was first set up, it was to uh, share data and, and communicate over distances internationally, uh, research networks, etc. And more and more we see that the usage is also happening locally. And this is where this next group of users can really benefit from the, in, in the internet that was first to connect from large distances. Also locally you can help organize yourself, uh, ranging from uh, doing business to uh, uh, getting things arranged with government to uh, communicating with each other, organizing neighborhood parties. So this is why facilitating this internet to also serve people who don't use Latin script who don't use the English language is, uh, for me, such an important thing. Thank you. So if we want the internet then to be available in different languages, what is needed to achieve this? Who are the stakeholders that can build a more digitally inclusive internet? Edna? Thank you, Mandy. And um, I mean, this is a topic uh, that is very dear to my heart. Um, when 20 years ago, I 
joined and started participating at the ICANN community to try to bring what is called internationalized domain names, basically domain names in your own native language, um, domain names and email addresses, in, 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 in fact. Uh, and I think that is, is extremely important. Um, in, in fact, I think, uh, <clears throat> As, as, as was mentioned, when it was first created, it was uh, it was it, you know uh, uh, alpha English alphanumeric domain names only. But um, because of the nature of the the internet today, uh, we have more than five billion users, and it's expected that another billion will join the internet in the next year or so. And these. I mean, a major majority of these users do not use English as their primary language. I mean, here in Ethiopia, obviously, you have Ethiopian names, uh, but can you use that Ethiopian name in your Ethiopian language for email addresses and domain names? That is something, you know, uh, uh, I, that's definitely very dear to my heart, but it's been working, we've been working on this for, for over 20 years, but does it, but why does it take so long? I want to, I guess, add a little bit. So the first 10 years really was spent on uh, developing the technology and open standards to support and to make sure that, because this is such a fundamental part of the internet, domain names and email addresses, such a fundamental part of it, changes to it needs to be very carefully you know, made. So it took us about 10 years to, to get through the open standards and put the technical standards in place at the IETF. And then the next 10 years is also not you know, just, <laughs> just thrown away. We spend another 10 years working through a lot of the uh, policies that needs to be put in place uh, for IDNs, for, for multilingual domain names to actually work well. Uh, in, for example, in English, uh, the uh, alphanumeric uh, names, you have the capital A or the small letter A, they are the same. But for uh, multilingual names, uh, like for example in Chinese, we have the simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese, they represent different domains on the, on the system. Mapping them back together on a policy level is an extremely important, and that's what we spent the next 10 years doing. So now, coming to what you can do. So after really 20 years of, of development, we're now seeing a, a, a technology that is, uh, that is available, and also the policies that are, uh, will be able to support the, the domain names and email addresses in place. So we now need to get it out the door and for people to use it. So who are the stakeholders? I think a couple of them are obvious. So of course, the technical community needs to adopt these new standards, making sure the systems are supporting um, new domain names and email addresses. Uh, users, of course, um, you know, need to go and demand those usage from, the, uh, uh, from your ISP, from your um, providers. But here at IGF, I want to emphasize two particular stakeholder groups that are really important, I think. One are governments. Because um, one of the things that is problematic and, and it, why it takes so long for um, multilingual domain names to become uh, known is that end users, most end users don't even know that they can use their own native language now in email addresses and, and domain names. So they're not demanding it. But what governments actually do is actually put procurement processes in place. Governments actually do a lot of procurement of IT, uh, and also to here we talk, you hear a lot of government talk about the uh, digitalization um, uh, uh, initiatives, and therein lies what we call uh, what we hope the governments can actually do is to make sure that their systems are compatible and support uh, languages and different languages and domain names and email addresses. And if they put it in the procurement process, what that does is a trickle effect, uh, a trickle effect uh, all the, uh, 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 the systems integrators in, in the country will immediately know, oh, we need to become compatible, we need to upgrade our systems to support email addresses and domain names in the local language and in different languages as well. That's one community. The other community that I want to stress here is the academia. Education. It's very important, I think, for, for new network uh, engineers that are you know, coming out of the uh, university or, or even high school, when they first learn about the DNS, when they first learn about email, they need to know that actually, the, today, the protocols already uh, allow uh, um, 
domain names and email addresses in different languages. So I want to, you know, I think those are the really important stakeholders, especially here at IGF, that I want to, you know, particularly call out to. And, you know, speaking of, uh, I'll end by saying that, you know, uh, we, I think it, Joran said it very well that it's, it's, it's imperative uh, for us to, to make sure that these different languages is, are supported by the DNS and the, and the email systems. I imagine one day, you talk about future generations, I imagine one day, uh, if we do it right, if we fix the issue now, there should be a time when you know, people would like, was the internet only available in English back then? You know, they would have forgotten that this is a new thing. I think that's where we want to be. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Additional comments? Oh. Uh, just, just, just one small addition. Uh, he didn't mention the other group, uh, the, the technical service providers, the, the, the internet community. What you can do already today, uh, whether you're a commercial provider or, 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 or working on standards or whatever, uh, is to test what you do on uh, whether it's usable uh, universally. So universal acceptance testing uh, is making sure that once this content becomes available, once these users are going to be there, that you're ready to serve that. Uh, because as you know, any bit on the internet goes from one end to the other via very uh, many different uh, services that all need to be able to uh, accept the code that we're sending through. I, I, only a few words I want to add. So as this capability comes, and as one of the things we talk about is adding new top-level domains in the future, these have to be part of that set of things that comes out. That uh, to come up with a whole lot of top-level domains in Latin characters may be nice, but it's not critically important like doing it with these names. But for these names to be viable, for these names to be something that are worth using and worth developing, all those intermediate services will have to be in place so that when you get a name in your character, in your language, in your character set, that it will actually be able to work with email. And, and I know that was brief, but those are all pieces of the puzzle that, that a lot of people are working on and, and, and ICANN maintains a focus on trying to make sure that all those pieces fall into place so that these things can work. Thank you. Now we've talked about the role of the technical community, we talked about the policy development process within ICANN, we've talked about ways that governments can use their procurement power, but I want to ask, what recommendations or advice can you share with policymakers? What, what does effective collaboration look like in this space? Should we start, Martin, then Jorn? Either way, uh, we sort of agree on a lot of things. Uh, basically, policymakers do get a bigger and bigger interest in the internet, and we see many of them around here, because the internet matters and is important and more crucial for society. So that they get an interest and want to make it work well makes a lot of sense. Now, what's important for policymakers uh, when they develop this is to, to realize that we're dealing with a global public good that, that is to serve the world, and that on that, they uh, have to play the role in a way that it's supporting their community and not uh, uh, leading to regulation or policies that would have negative consequences, unintended consequences on how it uh, plays out. So the awareness of how this works uh, the willingness to also reach out to other stakeholders uh, to consult, to see what the good way forward is. That openness, I think, is the biggest call. Take an interest and ask those people that know, because we know so much together. I mean, one of the, I often start my speeches by talking about the difference between the internet, how we define the internet, and platforms on top of the internet. Um, and I, I do that on purpose, and I often do that when I meet, meet legislators and, and people from government, because it actually makes a point. Often when you talk about 
and I'm very positive about the internet itself, uh, but often, I mean, I know that many of the discussions here at IGF are problem related. It's, it's fake news, it's bad information, it's, it's a lot of bad things that happens on the internet, on top of the internet, within platforms, within walled gardens. I mean, if you walk into a social media platform, you sort of leave the internet, you walk into someone else's computer. I know that some of the engineers would say, what did you say? <laughs> you use the internet to get into someone's computer. We're in there, that computer controls what you do. That doesn't exist the same way on the diversity of the internet. Why do I make this point? Because we have seen legislative proposals that actually is targeted against social media and platform companies that has an effect on how the internet actually works. And we've seen proposals that actually can disconnect people from the internet. And we've seen attempts from different parts of the world uh, that actually can have a real effect on your ability to actually connect. We're not talking about the applications on top of them or the information on top of them. We don't deal with that. So one of the things, we, when we talk to legislators, we're invited by the legislature, we're trying to make this, this point. We are not into content, that's other decision makers and other platforms who do it, but please don't touch what's the underlying DNA of the internet that actually makes it possible for you to be on. And we're spending more and more time explaining, and this is not only, you might think, oh, there are some bad countries out there. The thing is that we also have this conversation, what some of you would say was a good country, is a good region. Because there is, a, there is a growing feeling we have to do something. And, and I, I, in my speech yesterday, I, I said this, that we shouldn't forget that internet is an underlying technology for good. What people do with it, what we're trying to provide, is that ability for people to connect. Don't ever think that it's the same thing that happens on top of the internet. And that's a very important difference for me and us. By the way, I got a question from someone on Skype saying, who pays for you? We, everybody who's doing this, you should know, is doing it for a public interest. We, don't, we provide you, every time you go online, you hit about something that comes from us and our technical partners, and I saw Ripe coming into the room, who's one of them, or the country code operators. We actually, at the underlying technology that we do, we don't charge anyone to do. We provide this as a public interest to the world. We do get the money every time. Um, so I can just find out that if you buy a domain name, we get a very small portion of that uh, from most of the domain names, and we have a different ones. But you can't even donate money to us, so we're very independent. As small as less than a dollar. No, no online. Um, I do want to be a supportive. It is a hybrid, so we, do, we don't currently have any online questions. Are there any questions in the room? Thank you very much, everyone. Hello. Uh, Mark, that is God speaking. Um, usually an ICON GNSO counselor, but here on my own capacity as internet governance researcher. Um, as you were mentioning universal acceptance, um, there, there are pioneers here like Edmond, like Akinori Sun, and online as well. We have Dennis, we have Siva. Um, we are a strong community and we have been doing a lot of work. And it's really good that ICON.org has been backing up that effort. We do feel from the, from the CEO, from the board, that this effort is being backed up. And this really helps the project along. It, it, it helps the, the, the project grow. And this is definitely something that, you know, I think I can, I can speak for the community when we, we see that. One blind spot that has been, um, I think, a, a concern, a growing concern for us is our ability to reach out to companies, to private stakeholders. Um, we are pretty good at communicating with civil society, even governments will, will stop and listen to us, but reaching out to the private sector is something that, as an independent, you know, a semi-autonomous group, is starting to prove itself very difficult. We have managed to do that in isolation in certain cases, um, due to our own contacts, to, due to people do, who we have a personal relation with, but something that would be interesting looking forward, you know, as ICANN plans, you know, its next steps in, in relation to, to universal acceptance, is, to help us reach out. How do we exploit the fact that ICANN is a well-known global organization 
to help us reach to these commercial actors. So partially a question, partially a suggestion, but I would like to hear if anybody on, on the panel has insights on how we can keep advancing our mission and now starting to reach out to the companies who are developing the, these products. Thank you. First of all, good to see you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's like Edmund mentioned, we, it took 10 years to fix our technology and 10 years to fix the policies and now we're here. And we still have language panels around the world to look into it. And I, so what is lacking? Reality is demand. Uh, and you mentioned that as well. And, and, and so how do we, I mean, I guess that all of you are internet users. And, and you, mo then you probably have an understanding of Latin script because you use it. I can, so how do, you, how do you convince people that there is an alternative? So I, I totally agree with you, and, and we've spoken about that on, on the numerous occasions right now. We have to turbocharge this in a different way. But I actually do think that uh, the governments, to, to help them to put it into legislation, to put it into procurement, uh, is going to be a real booster. Because we can't, we can't reach every internet users on the planet uh, to talk with them, but governments are the biggest buyers of ICT. I haven't used the word ICT in 10 years or something. It's popped up again. They are the biggest buyers. I mean, in every individual country, they're the one who buys stuff. And if we can get a couple of countries, to, and we are working on a couple of countries, to see if they can sign up to say that we're going to, we're going to put it into legislation or procurement, that anything we do, at least it should support our script in our country, I think that would be a shedding moment. Um, so, but I, you know, I see it as a world of potential and opportunity, uh, but I know it's now time for us to step up. And thank you. And I also want to, we have a really good cooperation with the ICANN community about this and all of the experts about it. So what I'm actually saying is that you're right, and we have to do something different. Can I have I ever stopped you? I, I, I'm not going to try to answer that one. And, and part of that, and, and I, I I really like this mechanism that I hear of because it is an indirect mechanism. It's sort of sometimes you can't control something directly, but, but you can have. But the point is we will also need to be ready, which will involve both, you know, your, 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 the steering group and us in terms of as those procurement orders come out, making sure that the people that they're sending them to have the information they need to be able to, to fulfill it and, and such so that it isn't something that comes to them and they say, oh, you know, how do we do that? What is that? What are they talking about? But, and, and so it's, it's really, you, you, can, you can sort of have an actuator that is indirect, but, but make sure that the stuff is there for people to know what they need to do to fulfill. And now I'm going to give a, because we sometimes get a typical yarn answer. In very short time, we are actually coming back to the steering group with a also very concrete marketing thing, which I think you will enjoy. At least I do it. Uh, where we're going to try to do something a little bit radical and, uh, um, yes, a little bit different than we've ever done before. To walk the talk when it comes to how we can use um, alternative, uh, alternatives to the existing domain name structure and also use as an example uh, how you can make a showcase uh, of, uh, of IDMs. Was that a teaser? Ask Samara. He has the paper. I signed it off. Um, just adding on a few things in response to to your your suggestion and question. Um, no, I think I think you're right. Uh, we we need to reach out to to large organizations. You know, obviously Google, Amazon, Microsoft. You know, those, those kind. Of, uh, 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 companies to make sure that their systems uh, do support uh, email addresses and, and domain names in the, in, the, in different languages. I, I mean. The, the, it's really important there, I think, because um, you might not think uh, 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 today, you might actually use less, slightly less emails, but actually you don't. Every login 
uses an email address. Uh, most logins uses email addresses, and most, if you forgot your password, you know, they send it back to your email, you remember that. So those systems also need to be aware of being able to store uh, and process uh, different you know, email addresses in different uh, uh, languages. And one of the things I think um, uh, we, we definitely should do, but one of the things that, that's useful and tie back to the uh, new G GTLDs is that we do see Amazon, for example, apply for .amazon and also dot, uh, different, in different languages as well. And that helps uh, them become uh, uh, interested and and, and aware. So, so I think you know all, all of those uh, things kind of tie together as well. And, and one thing, uh, it's also a good demonstration of an area that is not that fell beyond our mandate on on the, the because it needs to be used also by the rest of the industry. Uh, and and thanks to setting up the universal uh, acceptance study group, we also have a vehicle where. It's not only I can, okay, we initiated it and we support it, but also those that are beyond uh, the DNS and uh, IP industry uh, also involved. Thank you. And Vera, do we have an online? So we have an online question uh, from, I'm sorry, I might butcher this name, uh, Siva Subramayan. His question is, uh, does ICANN have enough funds for its operations and for all the unseen core infrastructural investments that it might need to make? Without compromising on its neutrality and independence, are there ways of adding a few zeros to its revenue? Well, should I take this one? I, I would say that as a public interest non-for-profit organization we have the money we have and, and we are a fair for being what we're doing so and every, every number we have is official our official budget or official our budget is around 160 million dollars per year we have about 600 million dollars in our reserve funds that goes up and down a little bit and and we spend all the money we get in um, to make sure and we do that for, from a public interest perspective so we, we, we are, yes, we do investments, and we, well, we're going to announce 14th of December, one of the largest programs we actually ever done. Um, so tune in on December 14th. Uh, so, but remember, we, if you look at it, we are not, we don't build infrastructure in that sense. We build infrastructure, like the root server uh, cluster we built here, uh, is something we finance, and we have special funding to do that kind of investments. Um, but if you compare that to the larger investments by telecom operators, um, companies with house content, it's nothing compared to it. And we only invest in places where we know it's going to make a difference, like we did here in, in Africa, um, where we see that now a lot of the query traffic stays in Africa instead of going to Europe. It was a big difference. Uh, but we often work through partners. So when it comes to the funding, to add a couple of zeros to it, I mean, we could always do more with more money. But remember one thing. It's not me and the people on this board who actually decides ultimately where the money goes to. If you come into the ICANN community, you're part of the process of deciding where the money should go. And you're part of the prioritization where that money should go as well. Which is a fairly unique uh, constellation. Uh, it is actually the ICANN multi-stakeholder model, which is the governance model of all. And I, you know, but if I had more money, of course I could do more things. But the other thing is that it's important for ICANN to be part it, we should never trail away from what is our core business. What are we supposed to do? Um, and, and one of the benefits of having a budget or having what we do, we always stay very much tied into what is ICANN's core business, what is a part of our mission. Despite the fact that there are many things that would like to do, I like us to do different things as well. I hope that answers your question. I like, I ne in, I've been doing this for seven years. I never heard that question before, so thank you very much. Do we have any other questions in the audience, in the room? Okay. If you think of one later, please don't hesitate to ask. Vera, do we have any other online? All right. Well, I could ask you, I, ha I did have a more technical question, Edmund. 
I mean, we've talked about the importance of bringing people online and how to do this, but what is the most, what do you think the biggest obstacles are right now to accessing information for people to get it in their local language and scripts? What's a, from a technical perspective, what do we need to do? Edmund, why don't you start? Or we'll I, I'm, I'm happy to get started. I, I guess you know this. This really, uh, re it, as it relates to domain names and email addresses, I've already mentioned. You know, make sure that the, the systems around the internet actually start supporting uh, these uh, 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 domain names and email addresses in different languages. But I think. Um, Actually, uh, content, the, the other side of the story is also important. Um, having meaningful content in local languages is, is very important, and that kind of drives the use of, uh, I mean, they, it, they, they come in um, uh, kind of in tandem. Uh, it's kind of a, a virtuous cycle uh, with the local language content and utilization of local language email addresses and domain names. Um, and in terms of, I, I think, one of the key areas that, that ICANN is also working on. As I mentioned, in the last 10 years, we've been working on different types of policies, uh, one of which is the, the language policies, um, which uh, we will require you know, different uh, uh, stakeholders to come and join us. Right now, we have, uh, I think, 20-something scripts, and, and which represents most of the active uh, languages around the world, that is, that policies are already put in place. However, there's still many different languages uh, uh, that are not completely uh, com completed. Um, there are especially, you know, uh, uh, less well-used uh, uh, languages that, um, and that relates a little bit to uh, the SDGs of protection of, of cultural heritage and, and languages. And those type of uh, areas, we, you know, it would be good to to have stakeholders from those language communities to come to ICANN and and participate and and add those languages to um, the the, uh, uh, the 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 policy uh, well actually the policy repositories which we call label generation rule sets um, it's it's a mouthful but basically it's language rules um, as I mentioned uh, in in it, technically for English um, we map together different uh, the the capital A and small letter A, but other languages, we need to figure out whether there are these types of mappings, um, whether there are these type of variations that needs that, that needs policies to deal with. And that's uh, those are some of the things that I think uh, we need to call on people to come and participate at, at ICANN to make that uh, smooth for, for people uh, with indigenous languages to be able to connect to, to the internet with their, own, uh, with their own native script and language. Okay. Well. Uh, anyway, f thanks for that. Uh, that. That's that's key. I think what we should realize is that the people we're trying to serve here probably never considered using the internet yet, because why would they? They can't use this script. They can't use this internet. So that's why, next to being ready to really resolve in a universal way next to uh, governments that can make a big role by uh, requiring that to be part of the services they buy. Uh, it's also important to have a kind of comprehensive exercise uh, that, that, that really pulls people in, informs people, as well as offers them a reason to, be the, to, to, to really go there. Uh, we're, I'm personally following with uh, real interest also what uh, in particular India is trying to do here. They have eight scripts, 22 languages, out of my head, um, and they have a plan that they call Digital India, which is really to have the internet serve the community in getting online, uh, being served, and also integrate this IDN use and uh, the, the use of the, the different scripts and, and, and do this well. Uh, by making people aware on such a high level, by pushing also services that can really do it, by offering government services that will help do that, we may see a movement that shows to the world that it really can be done. And I really hope other regions will follow.
Mine is almost more of a question. My comment is almost more of a question and comes out of the other parts of my life, my work world, that is not I can. And it's a question I've always had. As we're doing this and we're starting to push it out to the users, to the schools, do they actually, okay, on some of the, the phones they may have it, but do they actually have the end user equipment in all of the schools and the towns available that can take advantage of this? And if not, how does that, how does that get filled? And I know I'm here to answer questions, not ask them, but this is one that sort of nagged at me. And while we're talking about the spread of IDNs, I'd really like to know whether it's all there, whether every school already has the right keyboards and machines and it's just they need something to hook it up to or where's that? Um, go ahead. I asked you. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Elisa Hever. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I was wondering, uh, I came in slightly late so sorry for that, but have you discussed um, whether we should think about IDNs to be an important part of the global digital compact and for some mentioning of that in the GDC. Um, thanks. Yes. We haven't talked about it here. And, and to be honest, I, I realized that there's a fragmentation in um, internet conferences. Um, also in the UN, with a lot of different new acronyms and, and sort of you know, working paths and people and envoys and, and all the time. So we're actually right now also trying to figure out where does ICANN fit into this. We have a natural point, point with the ITU. We, have a, we, are, we are members of the ITUD. Um, and it is a little bit, I mean, is that the right place for us to go? We don't know, because sometimes it doesn't survive that. But we have good conversations with many parts of the UN because they are important when it comes to this. I actually would like to answer your question as well. The keyboard problem. The keyboard, the keyboard problem. The keyboard problem is do you actually have uh, your local script on your device, your mobile phone, your, t you know. And it, that's one of the problems, which is that has to be in development in that that has to come from demand. Funny enough, I mean, there are many different scripts on many mobile phones. We can't use them because when you identify yourself on the internet, even if you use your social media, using your email, you can't use it. So we need to create a demand on this. But Edmund said something that also made me think. This is a belief rather than a science. But we, we believe, if you look at, and I know that data colonization is a new word for me. I heard that the first time, I think, this week. One thing we think is important is that to make this happen is that Internet is local and, and global at the same time. And we often talk it from a very l global perspective. You know, we can surf everywhere in the world. In, in many respects, a lot of the traffic is very internal. And, and one of the things I think is very important to build this local ecosystem that creates the services that is needed in that region. I mean, country code operators are ins insanely, insanely, or whatever, important in this because they often become the sort of hub where internet services grow. I mean, for if a country goes, if, if a country got digitalized, but all the traffic goes outside and you're using big services, and I, I guess there are some companies who now want to raise their hand and say I'm wrong, but, but, but the fact of the matter is that you, the more services you have local, the more knowledge you have local, you can also do services differently. You can do that in your local language, your local script, and that creates a demand. And that will also create a demand for the people who today have to make a choice between should I actually do the, buy the internet access or do, what should I buy clouds? The next billion users will not afford a $1,500 phone to go on a video service on. They won't. They need to find the reason why they go online. I mean, we are the elite. I went online because it was fun 30 years ago. I'm old. But the fact of the matter is it started as a fun thing. Now it became something important. And I think that the next billion users need to see that. And the local language and the local script and the local environment is going to be so important. That's why one of the reasons why here in, in, in Africa, to a program, we are helping through a capacity building program uh, with country code operators. We don't make policy of them. They're completely independent. And we're really grateful to be a part of that ecosystem. We do that because we think it's important. 
So this, when we talk about this, not only from an email perspective, it's a culture, it's a local thing as well. Oh, I can preach about this for a long time, sorry. Thank you. So I have a comment as well as a question. The comment is from this uh, previous uh, question asker, uh, Mr. Siva uh, Submarayan. Um, thank you for your observations. The core work is being very well done, but there might be required investments in areas still unseen and defined. A few zeros might be indeed uh, useful, enormously useful to the global public interest. And the question is from Jorge Cancio. How is ICANN going to engage with the Global Digital Compact? Example, is it uh, filling comments to the public consultations? And this question is directed to Edmund. <laughs> okay, I, I can start, but I, I am guessing that you would, would add to it. So um, I, I think our participation here at the IGF uh, is also input into the uh, Global Digital Impa uh, Compact. Um, and you know, I think that's one, one part of it. And just earlier today, I was in, uh, at, at a session talking about um, uh, uh, different topics and how we should, uh, 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 elements that we think are important to be included in, in the uh, Global Digital uh, Compact. But beyond that, perhaps uh, Muren can add to it. You said it well. Um, thank you. On the funding thing, uh, ICANN is setting up, and I think that we are very close to going official with it, something called the grant program, uh, where we have a fund uh, of quite a lot of money, um, which we, you can actually, if for doing things within our, the ICANN remit and mission, you can actually apply for money. Uh, we are launching that program. It's not going to happen in the next week or two, uh, but it's well above $100 million dollars that we will use for, that is actually a grant program for things that is interesting in this. So it's a lot of zeros in that, in that program. And right now I can't just remember which date we're having an update to the community about this uh, for some reason. Does any one of my staff actually remember? My staff is now looking down in the floor, uh, so I guess they don't remember. It, you can find it on the web actually. It is very soon. Uh, very, very briefly then, um, Mark, that is God for the record. Uh, in answer to what Avri mentioned, th this is actually an issue we have been discussing a lot in the Universal Acceptance Group. And an advantage of source that we have is that the developing world basically uses mobile phones. Mobile phones rely on virtual keyboards and on a lot of infrastructure that we can kind of know. Uh, they won't be using very expensive uh, systems. So it's a lot about us being able to reach out to the companies that make the more ma more mainstream, less super refined phones. You know, the the Chinese makers, the you know Samsung, the kind of phones that really have penetration in these markets, and making sure that their virtual virtual keyboards and that their OSs actually have compliance. Because what we found out during our testing is that even if Android Core is compatible with you, the the premises of universal acceptance maybe modules that they end up using in the system aren't. So it's it's about a lot of this sort of engagement, but it is kind of, sort of an easier problem to solve because we're not relying on physical hardware. It's more about the software part and that we can kind of work with. That, it, that's something that we have been learning how to do. So I'm fairly optimistic about that side. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, a um, moment, yes, very quickly. Uh, actually, yeah. this uh, grant giving webinar you can find on the icon site. It's at six o'clock local time tonight. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, having been involved in the Adrian script community for quite some time, um, I have first hand experience uh, in terms of developing leverage generation rules for scripts. Uh, uh, Given 
I mean, theoretically, we know that the, there are many, many more scripts uh, spoken worldwide, way, way larger than the number of scripts already added in the identity space. Um, but the f there, there is a specific requirement written in the LGR development uh, procedure. Not all languages are, are eligible for inclusion in the identity space. There, there are some criteria. I don't want to mention that here. So how big is the challenge for ICANN to undergo some sort of uh, baseline survey in terms of identifying which scripts can qualify for inclusion and so on? So on? Uh, because uh, otherwise, the, uh, th that's my feeling. The effort that we see in the inclusion of uh, scripts in the identity space may have some flavor of stop-start pattern uh, unless we have this uh, baseline study in place, uh, this one thing. And then I see uh, some, uh, uh, there are two fronts that which, which the USCG community and script communities have to deal with. Uh, we have the universal acceptance part and the identity part. We can't talk universal acceptance without having scripts that in the identity space. Then these two front, fronts are big challenges for ICANN. How I see some sort of uh, how would I say that, um, a delicate uh, balancing act, and then how is I can uh, cope these two challenges uh, uh, strategically? Thank you. I guess I'll start first. Um, very good question. Um, and yes, there are uh, other scripts as well. However, I want to emphasize that currently um, the, the work that has already been completed does cover uh, the major majority of the uh, languages and scripts that are actively used in the world today. That being said, um, there are two things that I want to highlight on what, on, based on what you said. Um, it, it, if the language or script is already in uh, Unicode, uh, which is a, a, uh, a, a technical standard that is not maintained by ICANN. It's actually maintained at the ISO, right? Is, is it now at the ISO or the Unicode Consortium separately? Um, uh, anyway, separate? Okay, so Unicode Consortium. If it's already there, um, then we can, of, of course, start working on um, the, the work. But if it's not already there, then the first step is probably to uh, have that language and script be included in the uh, Unicode, because that is what the um, what is called the internationalized domain names IDNs uh, standards are based on. So, so that's one, one part of it. The other part of it is that there are languages uh, and scripts that maybe we won't uh, uh, support. For example, Klingon. Uh, you know, uh, we might not. <laughs> might not, well, we might, but one of the criteria People has is... asked us to do that, by the way. It was no joke. <laughs> yeah, so so one, one important criteria is that it has an active usage uh, community, which maybe Klingon does have. Uh, but more importantly, I don't think uh, I can, you know, will pick and choose, you know, which language to to. Do. Actually, this is why we're coming out and, and asking the community to come and create those uh, those language tables, those uh, uh, policies that need to be put in place, so that those languages can be added to to the root and, and so on. So, so I think that's the more important part. Is we we I don't think I can is in the business of ch picking and choosing which language. Of course, it has to have a community that's actively uses that script and, and language but then you know we need that those com those community to, to to come to ICANN and create those those policies yes I apologize if there are any other online. We will take them. Uh, we'll try and answer them in writing later. But our last questioner in the room, please. Okay. My name is Hossein Mirzapur from Iran, for the record. First of all, I have to thank uh, the ICANN crew for uh, providing such a floor for uh, challenging them with our questions. Uh, to be quick, uh, actually, uh, you're on here, and uh, yesterday in the opening ceremony, you brought up this interesting topic of uh, paying more attention toward local languages and everything local. Uh, the good example of comparing people who speak English and uh, 
the content, English content in the web uh, was very, very bright example of this, uh, let me call it lack of balance of local and global values today, or contents today across the web. Uh, my question is, as, as far as I can, is registered. I know that you have been probably challenged by this question several times in many years, many times. Uh, but my clear question is that as far as I can is registered inside California, a province inside the US, and of course you have some responsibility and obligations because of that. If in one case that uh, you're, uh, the understand interpretation, the I can different communities interpretation of one reality is uh, not, uh, you know, compatible with what what is the law in that region and uh, territory. Or uh, I don't know if uh, you find some uh, some uh, you 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 know very well uh, what I mean. You you have uh, cases in uh, I'm very sure. What is the procedure inside I can to uh, you know to respond to that? Thank you. And you're right, you know, I asked this question several times. So it's right, ICANN is a California incorporated non-for-profit organization. And, and as long as we can't place ourselves on Earth, on the moon, sorry, we have to be in some legal um, surrounding somewhere. And it's a history because the internet, the identifier systems and the actually came out of this place. Um, and the windsurfer is here is one of the funders. But remember one thing. It's not the ICANN legal entity who makes decisions about policies. We have people from 160, 170 countries coming to meetings, last time in Kuala Lumpur, next one in Cacahuan, Cacahuan, Mexico, sorry. Um, and they come in and make the decisions about, I don't, I'm executing the decisions. These people here tell me that this comes from the community, you now go and do it. I mean, ICANN Org is an international organization in the sense that we have people in, we have, we, we have people in 35 countries who speak 55 languages. I have this question often, but I also say that being a, incorporated as a non-profit organization in California, it creates an extreme transparency of everything here. You can check anything we do, including how much I, my, my money I make. Uh, don't go and check. But you can check how much money they make. Uh, I, mean, to the, I mean, even private information is shared because I have this possession. And so, I don't, and, and we have served the world for 35, 25 years, I can become 25 years next year. Um, and, and no one has ever seen that anything has happened that we have, that, where we have actually been, been challenged from a legal perspective in the US. And also remember, until 2016, we had a relationship with the US government. Through the so-called transition, uh, the US government gave up that last sort of point to it. And after that, we're governed purely by the, by the, uh, the multi-stakeholder model. So, but remember, ICANN is not, ICANN org, the legal entity, is not the one who makes the decision. You can, you know this because you start coming into ICANN meetings. You can walk into an ICANN meeting as representing yourself, representing your country, representing yourself, and actually come up to the table and have something to say. And it's unique. And I, I sometimes call it, and now I digress and I come over time, I can, with our ecosystem and our partners, one of the biggest peace projects in the world. How many places in the world can you actually come in and meet people from 100 countries, from different backgrounds, with different interests, and talk about something so important as the internet? And that's why I sometimes call the internet the biggest equalizer in the world. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our panelists and all of you in the room and those of you online for a, an interesting and, and successful panel. Um, there is a webinar on the grant program, evidently, at 6 p.m. local time tonight. If you look on our website, it will give you a link. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.